Today I'm going to make the video that I would have loved to watch after getting started with Home Assistant. I'm going to take you through 12 steps that are necessary to take you from a novice to a pro. Now, let's just roll the intro. If you want to master Home Assistant, then you're going to need to learn YAML. YAML is the way that we can interact with Home Assistant using code. And don't be scared when I say code, there isn't any coding or programming language that you need to learn. First of all, to access the configuration files in Home Assistant, the most common way is to use add-ons. Now add-ons are pieces of software that run alongside Home Assistant. Not all Home Assistant versions have add-ons. For beginners, you can use file editor. The Home Assistant configuration file is composed of several YAML files. The main YAML file is the configuration.yaml. That's your starting point where you would add new integrations, the ones that you can't use the user interface for. Automations.yaml is the place where you're going to add all of your automations. Then there's several other YAMLs like secret.yamls where you add in your passwords, groups, scripts, and much more. All these different files are connected into one file when Home Assistant is reading them. If you look at the configuration.yaml and take line 9 of my configuration, you'll find that include groups.yaml. Home Assistant, these are not really split. It just sees them as one big file. So it takes the content of groups.yaml and it puts it inside a big file and it does that for every single line that you use the include in. You can see that I've split my automation files and more about that in step number three. The key value pair concept is quite crucial. The key is everything on the left of the colon and value is everything on the right. So if you can see at line 13, scene, that's your key and your value is everything afterwards. Anything that has two spaces underneath something else indicates that that is a part of, so basically it is a subgroup. Switch over here is the key. The value here is extending on several lines. This piece over here represents my Samsung TV. Now within this configuration itself, you can notice two things. First of all, there's that dash. That dash indicates that this is a list. Now, if you only have one value, you don't need the dash. But if you have more than one value, like I have, for example, underneath here, I have a switch bot. So that's my second value, so I need another dash. It doesn't matter what you use first, so you could do dash name instead of doing dash platform, but I'm gonna keep it easier to read, so I'm always putting dash platform when I have a list. And within this piece of code itself, the concept of the key value pair continues. So you see the key is Mac, and the value is the Mac address. And over here, as you can see, the service media player .turn underscore off is part of turn off and you can see the two dots. So that's how YAML works. Next week, I'm gonna make a video on the step that is the most unclear for you. So let me know in the comment section down below which one you wanna make. And remember to upvote if you already see it there. Step number two is to edit your configuration files with Visual Studio. This is gonna make it so much easier to spot mistakes, especially at the beginning when you're not comfortable with YAML. There's an add-on for Visual Studio code, but if your system isn't capable of running it, you can have Visual Studio installed on your computer and do something like a Samba connection so you can build the file systems yourself. Now, why this is so much easier is something called autocomplete. Now, over here, I'm gonna add another line. So I'm adding another list and you can immediately see we have some of the keywords. If I type light, you can see all of the lights that I have configured in my home system. So I don't need to remember how I called my dining lights. Visual Studio Code also enables you to use it as a terminal, which makes it super easy to install things like hacks. It also helps you with errors. Now you can see I've added service twice and it's giving me duplicate key. Remember when I said everything on the left of the colon is a key. So I have service in twice, so you can't duplicate keys. That is a key tip. I've said key too many times, let's move on. Splitting configuration files is something that's gonna make it a lot more easier for me and you to read. You're not gonna get any performance improvements with splitting files, because at the end of the day, Home Assistant is gonna compile them back up again, but it's gonna be a lot easier for you to manage. Look at my automation.yaml file. I have 300 lines of automations. And if you scroll through this, you might get confused and it's difficult to find where things are. But what you can do is you can create a folder system. Now you can see over here, I created this folder structure and I've got different things like buttons, doorbells, garage, heating, home security, and I have it all nicely organized. So you can create as many folders and subfolders as you wish. And then you can just create YAML files. And in these YAML files, what I recommend doing is having this sort of format. You start with a dash and always indicate ID. ID, you're gonna need ID. 
for the user interface whenever you want to see things from that point of view. The ID and alias always keep it the same name, but ID needs all underscores and aliases can be fine with spaces. Here you can decide the orders of things, so you can have trigger condition action or trigger action condition. I keep it trigger condition action and then mode at the end. So keep your automations descriptive as much as they can so you, when you look at them in the future, you actually know what they're doing. If you're enjoying this video, remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel for the next tip that's gonna drop next week. Step number four, save time by using scripts. Now I know when you're excited, you're just jumping in and creating these automations, but after a while, you're figuring out that you're repeating yourself. Scripts are just a time saver. What they do is they collect a several actions that you normally do in automations and it allows you to reuse them. Let me show you how you can achieve that. Notify all is one of my favorite scripts that I have in my smart home. In Home Assistant, we can create custom notification to all of our devices. Every single automation that I need to do, I would need to repeat all of these every time and that will get tiresome. And also, if you change your device, then you have to go back and update all of your automations, or if you want to add a fourth device that you purchase later, you get the point, it just becomes a headache. The script that I got over here takes in two variables, which is another thing you can do with scripts. You can take in a title and a message, and then I have exactly the same title and message. In the automation sections, in the action type, call service, use whatever your script name is called, and over here, you need to pass in the data required for your own script. Scripts are a massive time saver and I really recommend you losing them. Step number five is to rename entities and devices. I've got a huge amount of devices, so I don't really want you to do this for every single entity and device that you're using, but I think you should do it for every entity and device that you are planning to use. And as soon as you do start using a new one, then just go about renaming it because sometimes the name that comes through the system it's just, it just doesn't make any sense. Let me give you an example. This, I care a vibration battery level. So it's the battery level of the vibration sensor. It comes in with this weird name, Lumi Lumi vibration power. This doesn't mean anything. So if you have five vibration sensors, you really don't know which one to go and change. So it will be just, it's just a mess. This is a great example over here of one that's a little bit more sensible, bedroom power but what, which bedroom, what does that make any sense? Here's another one coming directly from the two app, cover.66030, what does this mean? So go and rename them all. If you can come up with a naming convention, a naming convention is a standard way of naming things, which I haven't personally done, which I would have loved to do at the start, and then I think you're really a genius. Uh, but yeah, that is a great idea if you've got a naming convention, it's a standard way of calling things, that's awesome. One tip I can give you is that if it is a switch or if it's a light, you will know that by everything that's before the dot. So if you see switch, don't put switch at the end or light or and repeat light again. When you do change the entity ID, you remember also to change the name in a way that it sort of matches or it enhances it even more. You can also change the icon if you want the icon to be a little bit different and it's gonna save you a lot of time in dashboards because when you pull this into a dashboard, it will automatically default to the icon that you can see over here. The same applies for devices and you'll find them here. If you've already built a lot of automations and you wanna rename them, but it's gonna take you a long time, then do this. Use the sensor replace feature, and this is quite common with Notepad, Atom, Visual Studio, and find every time that you've mentioned the old entity ID, either in your dashboards or in your automation files, and just control replace it. Step number six is to declutter your automations. Now, when we get started, we are creating all of these fancy automations. Half of them, we just turn them off because they don't make any sense, which is fine because we love to experiment here in this channel. But after a while, I do recommend you actually deleting them. And also think about the ones that you've never actually ever used. Do you really want them or not? You can keep them, but if you keep them, it could just clutter your system. An easy way to find is go to your automations, look at the last triggered. This will give you the latest automations that have triggered, but you can also switch it up in the reverse. You can find that automations that haven't been on for a while and you wonder why and you can go about deleting them. Some of these automations have this run actions blanked out. This actually means that this is an automation that's ever been renamed, but Home Assistant has lost a reference for it. And most likely there's a duplicate. So at this stage, you can't run that action. So this is completely useless. To so go over here to the I and just click remove entity and remove. Step number seven is organize better your automations. 
So with split automations previously, we've decluttered and found automation that we don't need. Now the third step is a crucial step. So think of organizing your automations in a better way. One way of doing it is actually using Node-RED. Now, if you've never used Node-RED before, Node-RED is a GUI, it's a user interface tool, which allows you to build these nodes, which are like automations and they're really cool. I'm in a video that you'll find right here, Node-RED against Home Assistant, you can sort of make up your own mind. Not many people realize that automations can have multiple actions and multiple trigger points. The eighth step you can take to become a Home Assistant Pro is to start using groups or areas, depending on which one you prefer. I'm personally a fan of groups, and that's what I use. Groups are simply a collection of entities. After that, you've renamed all of your entities in a beautiful manner, and you can create groups. Two really important groups I think that everyone should have is external door contact sensors. So if you have multiple doors or multiple windows, you want to group them together. Same with motion sensors. By grouping motion sensors together, you can actually find out if there's any motion in the house. So this is very useful if you're away and you can find out which actual motion sensor is triggered. So you can use these in dashboards to save a lot of time and space. Special mention are also light groups. Light groups are a collection of lights, which are certainly different than groups. I've made a video about this, light groups versus light groups. If you wanna find out more, you'll find the link up top. A top tip that I talk about in that video is that you can do nesting. So you can have groups of groups of groups. So let's say in your kitchen, you have multiple lights. So you wanna group them together and have kitchen lights. Then you say the kitchen is on the ground floor. You wanna group all of the lights down at the ground floor and you can say ground floor lights. And then you're gonna say all of the lights of the house or all internal lights. You could create another group and you can have all external lights and you can have all lights. So you can create like a pyramid of groups. This is gonna allow you uh, to reduce repetition. So if you rename or you need to add a light to your kitchen, you just add it to the lower group and then all other groups that are referencing it will have it automatically within. So that's a cool one. Next set tool has been a Prime System Pro is to start backing up your configuration file. There's two ways of doing this. You can create a big snapshot and put this somewhere else, either on Google Drive, or you can just create it manually, maybe every time you're doing something big, download it on your PC. Another way is actually you start using GitHub. Now I know GitHub is a lot for developers, but over there you can share your code and enhance the community. Remember, if you do do that, do not share your contents with a secret or YAML or any passwords or any sensitive information like your address. At a certain point, everyone has broken their home assistant instance, so you are going to need a backup. You can find backups in Supervisor under backups. A thing I want to mention here is that in the back, these backups can become a little bit big. So if you have a lot of these backups, you'll find out that these are cluttering a lot of space. So you might want to actually delete the backups once you've taken the backups and you've stored them in a safe location either on your computer and maybe multiple copies. Today's 10th Home Assistant tip is gonna be grid cards. Grid cards, I love grid cards. If you don't know what grid cards are, they are the best way to create and organize dashboards in Home Assistant. You can see over here, I've got a grid card that I use for my iPhone and it's just one card and the one card is a grid card. Understanding how grid card works is gonna be crucial for your dashboard design. If you are struggling with that, then there's gonna be a link on top here to this full video, it's around 40 minutes, where I actually go through and I explain and I demo how to create dashboards with grid cards. Go and check that out. If you don't know what grid cards are, you're gonna need to master grid cards. The 11th tip is helpers. Helpers are maybe one of the most underrated features in Home Assistant, but I think use in the right way can be super, super cool. Helpers are entities that are not smart devices. So these are entities that you create and you control yourself. So they can't just change state. You need to change their state. For example, you can create a guest mode and you can have it on and off. So you can turn on guest mode and you can disable certain announcements or you can disable certain motion sensors or alarms and you can toggle that off, for example, when the guests have left. I'm also using it for Sonos Party Mode. So when I have Sonos Party Mode toggled on and I toggle that on manually, I have all of my speakers starting joining the main group as soon as I enter the room and they pick up motion. Another helper is the kitchen natural light and you can have a slider. So that will figure out which is the threshold in which your motion tends to start turning on depending on how dark the room is. The 12th home assistant tip is to create a lab home assistant or a development home assistant. 
what Salah Promise isn't going to do for you. It's just going to make your production or your actual real system super, super stable. So when you do experimentation and you're learning and you're trying new things out, you most likely going to break your system. And what you want to do is, is have a separate environment that runs alongside your main home assistant where you can play around and do all sorts of experiments. That is going to be really cool because by just learning and playing with home assistant is what's going to make you a home assistant pro. If you want to actually see me building my whole smart home from scratch, then I'm going to link the home assistant course that I made, build a smart home with home assistant. And with that, you'll find many more courses on the platform. So check the link down in the description below. If you want to learn more about Home Assistant, then click this video right up here. I'll see you in the next one. This is Gio. Ciao.